You're listening to the Mens Rea Podcast, and this is the story of the Irish Scissor Sisters. Welcome back and Happy New Year. Thanks for sticking with me over the last few months. I had to take an unexpected break from the podcast for health reasons. But not to worry, things are looking up and I'm looking forward to the new year to see what it brings. I hope it brings great things for all of you out there. And now on to the first story of the new year. Just a heads up that some of the names in the story have been changed to protect the children involved. Shilaila Syed Salim was born in 1965 in Kenya. His father was Syed Salim and was a Somalia national, but he died when Shilaila was a young man. His mother, a Kenyan named Samoe Bakri Shigu, was 18 when she married Syed, and they had two sons. Shalila's brother would later move to and settle in Toronto. Salim arrived in Dublin on the 30th of December, 1996, after flying from Mombasa to Rome and taking a connecting flight. When he arrived here, he told the immigration services that his name was Farah Swale Noor, the name we'll be using for the rest of the story, and that he was a Somalian national who was fleeing the civil war. He said that he had initially gone to Kenya and lived in a refugee camp there for a number of years. His wife was killed in Somalia and his three children were missing. He was allowed into Ireland and was guided through the asylum seeker process here. Initially, his application was rejected, but he was granted asylum on appeal. In August 1997, Farah met a Chinese girl in an arcade, Dr. Quirky's, on O'Connell Street in the city centre. He brought her back to his apartment and forced himself on her. She ended up pregnant. It was the only time she ever had sexual contact with him in the few months that they were together, and he left her when he found out. He never met his son. Soon Farah met his next girlfriend, Paula, who happened to be a teenager. She was in third year in secondary school, so 15 or so. He told her that he was 20, when in fact he was in his early 30s. He was introduced to her parents and even lived with them for a time. Eventually, Paula became pregnant and they had a son. It was shortly after this that Farah began beating her. He would drink heavily and then attack her. He was jealous and violent and he had raped her. It took Paula years to get away from him. Eventually, she left in 2001. Farah continued to stalk her and she took out a barring order against him and finally won full custody of their son in April of that year. The next woman that Farah found himself with was Kathleen Mulhall. She left her husband of 29 years, with whom she had six children, to be with Farah. They moved to Cork, but never settled down anywhere for very long. Farah continued to beat and rape Kathleen, who was often seen with bruises. She had to go to the hospital three times, and the guards, the Irish police, were often called. But Farah was often seen cut and bruised too, so it would seem that there was a pair of them in it, and Kathleen gave as good as she got too. Eventually, they returned to Dublin and moved to Richmond Cottages in the north inner city. On St. Patrick's Day of 2005, Kathleen and Farah were spending the day celebrating in what was then the rather run-down pub, Parnell Mooney's, just off O'Connell Street in the inner city. As usual, they had been drinking heavily, and as the pub was packed upstairs, they decided to make their way to the even dingier downstairs area. Kathleen began talking to another man, and Farah lost his reason. He punched the man in the face with a nail clipper. The other man managed to prevent him landing another punch, and Farah was thrown out of the Parnell Mooney by a bouncer. The guards were notified and came by and questioned Farah about the incident. Luckily for him, he was not arrested, and Kathleen eventually joined him outside, and they went back to their flat. The morning of the 20th of March, Linda and Charlotte Mulhall, Kathleen's daughters, began drinking early in their telehome. Linda was minding her 11-year-old son while they downed vodka and cokes, starting at around 11, and finishing when they decided to meet their mother, who was in Dublin City Centre, drinking with her boyfriend Farah. The boy was dropped at his uncle's house, and the two women made their way into town. Linda was 30 years old and had been having a rough time of it. Her ex-boyfriend had just been sent to prison for seven years for assaulting three of her children, which had resulted in all four of her kids being put into care. While she was apart from them, she began drinking heavily and doing heroin, and had moved back into her father's house to try and get things under control and keep her kids. The girls met up with their mother and her boyfriend in O'Connell Street, the main street of the city close to the Northside Shopping District. They continued to drink and bought bottles of Coke, which they mixed with vodka that they got from a liquor store or an off-license. They wandered around the city, joking and laughing and browsing the shops. They were all on government assistance, so none of them could afford to buy drinks in the pub. They decided to sit on the boardwalk that ran along the River Liffey. It had been built to serve as a pleasant walkway for tourists and city dwellers to take in the cityscape, but since its building had been the domain of drug dealers and addicts and is still effectively a no-go area right in the city centre. Guys, if you visit Dublin, don't go to the boardwalk. Please. After some time had passed on the boardwalk, the three women all took ecstasy. Linda had had a little baggie with a few pills in it. Farah Noor was already drunk, so they didn't give him one. He'd been drinking since he woke that morning with Kathleen in his flat in Ballybaw and had spent the previous weekend, which was St. Patrick's Day Festival, drinking as well. The women each took two more pills in the following few hours that they sat on the boardwalk. Kathleen and Linda had a strained relationship since Kathleen had left the girl's father and taken up with Farah Noor five years previously. She had not only walked out on John Mulhall, but also their six children. Charlotte was more relaxed about the situation. Linda tried to keep the peace between them, though. 
As the day wore on, Farinor's mood worsened. He went from amiable and drunk to aggressive and started picking fights with Kathleen. Kathleen decided that she had had enough and grabbed Farah and pulled him towards O'Connell Street. The girls followed. The couple were roaring and shouting at one another while the girls walked ahead, trying to ignore the argument unfolding in a mix of languages behind them. At one point, Farah saw a young Asian lad outside the Savoy Cinema on O'Connell Street and was insistent that this was one of his sons by another relationship. He'd never met the boy, but he was convinced of it and tried to grab hold of the child. Kathleen screamed at him to leave the boy alone and that it wasn't his son and that they were to go home to Ballybah. They were spotted by a friend of Farah's on O'Connell Street, who was also from Somalia, and his girlfriend. He called over to the group and was introduced to Kathleen and her daughters. They made little to no conversation. The man, Ali, noted that although they were all drunk, Farah was by far the worst off. They would be the last people to see Farah Swally Noor alive. Eventually, they all arrived back at the flat that Kathleen and Farah shared at Richmond Cottages, near the Royal Canal. It was a two-story house that had been divided into four tiny flats. When they arrived and settled into the filthy apartment, Kathleen went about preparing drinks for the group, vodkas for the girls, and beer for Farah. She also crushed an ecstasy pill into Farah's drink so that he would be on the same kind of buzz as the rest of the group were on. Farah staggered his way into the living room. He had been drinking for nearly 12 hours straight. He sat down next to Linda on the couch and then started to come on to her. He grabbed her by the shoulder and was whispering in her ear. She tried to get away from him and was yelling for him to stop, for her mother to get him to stop, but he wouldn't. His grip on her was like a vice and she couldn't get away. He then turned his attention to Kathleen and lurched towards her, forcing her back towards the bedroom. He was making a motion as if to indicate that he would slit her throat. Kathleen started to yell at her daughters, please kill him for me, kill him for me. She said that if she stayed any longer with him, she would be dead soon. So Charlotte went into the kitchen and picked up a Stanley knife then slashed at Farah's throat, causing a four-inch gash. He fell to the floor in the bathroom and bashed his head on some furniture. He called out for Kathleen, but Charlotte came up behind him and again slashed at him with the blade. As he tried to get up, Linda came at him with a hammer and beat him around the head with it as he lay there. Linda continued to beat him, and then Charlotte began to stab him all over, to make sure that he was in fact dead. Linda and Charlotte then came out of the bedroom, holding hands, and told their mother that Farah Noor was dead. She had been in the small sitting room during the whole attack. The three women broke down and cried and wailed and sobbed uncontrollably until the girls then, realizing what they had done, saw that they needed to get the body out of the flat. They moved Farah into the tiny shower room, six foot down the hallway, and got a bread knife. Kathleen stayed in the living room. She would not witness what happened next to her boyfriend. Linda and Charlotte used the bread knife, the Stanley knife, and for more stubborn body parts, such as the kneecaps, the hammer, to dismember Farah Swelly Noor. It took about four hours to complete, and by the time they were done, the flat was a complete mess. The bedroom and bathroom were covered in gore, and towels, the bed sheets, and their clothing were soaked in blood. Now that Farah was in eight more manageable pieces, they would have to figure out a way to get the body out of the flat and into the canal without being noticed, and get rid of all the blood-stained clothing and towels. They were going to need help. Kathleen called her ex, John Mulhall. The girls went about trying to clean themselves up. They couldn't take showers because Farah's body was still lying in the shower tray. They began packing up the pieces of him into black rubbish bags and putting them into sports bags that Farah and Kathleen had used to haul their stuff around in the course of their many moves over the previous five years. They would tell people that Farah had left to be with one of his ex-girlfriends and had packed up his clothes and wallet, taking the few euros that were there and holding onto his jewellery so that it could be sold later. The bag was put out in the communal rubbish area where it would be taken away by the binmen. At about 1am, John Mulhall arrived. He was greeted at the door by Kathleen, who bluntly informed him that his daughters had killed Farah. He went into a rage and tore through the house, taking in the scene. He was furious and left, despite his daughters crying and pleading for his help. This was far too serious a situation for him to get involved with. At that point, Charlotte and Linda needed rest. They were exhausted and headed into the bedroom where they had just stabbed and beaten their mother's boyfriend, lay down on the bed, and went to sleep. Meanwhile, Kathleen went to work. She took boiling water and bleach to the shower and began methodically wiping down all the surfaces and rinsing away blood and gore that had been left behind. Just cleaning the shower took an hour and a half, by which time the girls had gotten back up again, unable to get any rest. They decided to help their mother in the bathroom and began cleaning down the tiled floor with hot water and bleach. Then they moved onto the walls. The toilet became blocked with pieces of flesh and bone that they attempted to flush away down it. The first cleaning of the bathroom took over three hours. In the bedroom, there was a five-foot-wide blood stain on the floor and blood spatter covered nearly every surface in the small room. The carpet would have to be taken up, and they went about cutting out a large square from the thin blue flooring. The blood had not soaked through the carpet and underlay to the concrete floor. They cut the carpet into thin strips and put them into yet another black plastic bag. The women spent the entire night cleaning the house, from the bathroom to the bedroom and the trail of blood down the hall between the two. Eventually, things were somewhat back in order. They would need to clean everything again, but by morning they were changing their clothes and cleaning themselves up in order to try and carry out the next phase of their cleanup. At 6am the buzzer at the flat's door rang and the women panicked. Who would be calling by at such an hour? It rang again and again, and eventually they realised it was John Mulhall. He came in and said that he couldn't change what had happened, but he would help. 
He methodically went through the house, stripping the beds and picking up blood-soaked towels and clothing, and packed three more black bags, which he then brought out to his van. The bags were stored in his garden shed until the 13th of July of that year, when he loaded them back into his van and drove to Leakslip in Kildare. He'd been hired to do some work in a garden that backed up onto the River Liffey. He dumped the bags into the river, and they washed downstream, like ordinary rubbish. Despite being watched by a neighbour, no one confronted John about his fly-tipping, and he just got into his van and drove away. But the house he had been using as a staging site for the dumping was his boss's, and connections were eventually made, and that section of the river was sealed off and searched. A number of items connected to Ballybock were found, and a large household wheelie bin with the number 31, the address of the Mulhall family home in Talla, was found. John was questioned about the dumping in September. He denied that anything had come from the scene in Richmond Cottages, and nothing could be conclusively linked by the Gardaí to the flat. At about 7am on the 21st of March, the three women left the flat with Linda and Charlotte carrying black sports bags. They walked past heavy commuter traffic on one of the main routes into the city centre for cars and buses heading in from the northern suburbs of Dublin. It was a short walk from the house to the Royal Canal, a waterway that runs from Dublin across the country to the west. When they reached a relatively secluded place, the women emptied their bags of the black sacks and they headed back to the house to collect the rest of the remains to dump. They made as many as six trips to dispose of the eight pieces that they had cut Farah into, minus his head. They had left the cloths and towels steeping in hot water and bleach, so when the last bags were dropped into the canal, they returned to the flat and scrubbed it yet again. They cleaned the kitchen thoroughly and steeped the Stanley knife and hammer in bleach before wiping them down for prints for good measure. When they were done, they gathered all the cloths and towels, put them in another black bag, and set them out next to the carpet in the communal rubbish area. Now the only thing left to get rid of was Farah Swale Noor's head. They decided that they would go out to a park that they were familiar with in Tala and bury it, and get rid of the blade and hammer while they were at it. Now bearing in mind that Tala is on the far side of the city, so that's one bus into town and another out to Tala, at least an hour and a half on buses. They decided that the bags that they had used to cart the rest of Farah's body were too soiled and smelly to bring with them on the bus across the county, so they found a camera bag belonging to Kathleen and put the head in it. They then headed off to begin their cross-county journey. First, though, they stopped at the shop and had a breakfast roll, a small baguette filled with sausage, bacon, hash browns, and other breakfast items. It was around noon when they were caught on CCTV at the local convenience shop picking up the sandwiches, water, and some cigarettes. They got into town and got in the 77 bus out to Tallow, and once there, headed for Time and Park, just across from the square, a large shopping centre. They wandered around the park for hours, trying to find a place to bury the head. Eventually, Charlotte began to dig near a bench that they were resting at, and that was where they ended up dumping his head, in a shallow hole in the hard ground near a bench in the park. The Stanley laid and the hammer they threw into the lake in the park. It was near seven when they left. Linda went back home to the Kilclare Heights house, and Kathleen and Charlotte headed back to Richmond Cottages. Linda later burned the camera bag in the hearth at her home, and put the remnants into her wheelie bin, apparently before her father dumped it into the River Liffey. Charlotte began drinking when she got home, and Kathleen cleaned the bathroom again. Kathleen would be recorded going to her local shop a number of times over the next few days, buying bleach, cleaners, black bin bags, and air freshener. On the evening of the 30th of March, 2005, James O'Connor was walking home from being out with friends in Dublin City Centre. His route took him along the banks of the Royal Canal. He stopped at the Ballybock Bridge and watched a group of young lads fishing. He was snapped out of his daydream when he realised one of the lads was shouting at him. When he looked down, he saw what he thought was a mannequin floating in the water. When he got closer, he realised he was seeing arms and a leg and part of a torso. As we all know, it's never a mannequin. James made his way back up to the road and rang the emergency services from his mobile phone. Two fire engines and an ambulance were dispatched. First things first, the ranking officer asked the fireman to help them fish out one of the arms to confirm whether this was a real human body rather than a hoax. This was done rather quickly, and then the arm was replaced as closely as possible to where it had been lifted from. The area was sealed off as a crime scene, and lighting was set up while fire services waited for the guardie to arrive. The first guardie arrived on the scene at five past seven as the crowd began to gather. This was a busy thoroughfare, and people watched as the Garda forensic team went about their work documenting the dump site and retrieving evidence. After the guardie established their crime scene on the banks of the canal, they went about the painstaking process of collecting both the body and the evidence left in the area. Each section of the body was gathered by a dive team who went into the canal and was collected with some of the canal water it was found in. The guards weren't sure what might be part of the crime scene, so they gathered anything that could potentially be evidence from the banks of the canal. Just note here that Dublin isn't a very clean city. We're not great at keeping it clean, and the north inner city is, to this day, a litter black spot for the entire country. They collected cigarette butts, chewing gum, and other pieces of rubbish, and took samples of feces that were found under the Ballybuck Bridge. The items of clothing found with and on the body, a long-sleeved Ireland football jersey, and some socks, were preserved. The section of the canal that the body was found on was closed for a number of days. Initially, when Farah's body was pulled out in pieces of the water, he was so damaged they couldn't tell whether he was black or white. His body was sent to the coroner for examination, and his cause of death was determined to be due to the stab wounds he suffered. But the guardie had no identity for the man. After the autopsy, it became clear that they were looking for someone who had come from Africa, but there was no obvious way to identify him. 
They began checking fingerprints against the Interpol database and asking around the immigrant and asylum seeker communities about missing men. There was a surge of people coming from Africa to live in Ireland at the time, both through immigration and through the asylum process. Many of them were men in their 20s and 30s. It wasn't unheard of for them to drop off the map, and the Gardaí initially had 62 names to check out, to begin with. The Gardaí also collected CCTV from the area surrounding the crime scene and began the mammoth task of trying to identify suspicious behaviour that might be connected to the dumping of the body. There was a reward posted. The crime was kept in the media, which was no difficulty given the sensational nature of the crime, and it also appeared on Crime Call, asking for people to make contact with any information. Tips began pouring in. Also, near the end of the month of March, two park rangers in Time and Park noticed something buried behind a bench near the lake in the park. They investigated and saw that whatever it was had black hair. They didn't look too closely, however, and decided it was likely a dog, so they threw more dirt on top of it and carried on with their duties. Money was withdrawn from Farinor's bank account on four different occasions in the month of March, the last time being on the 30th of March, the day Farinor's body was found and pulled from the Royal Canal. Charlotte and Kathleen were seen on the ATM's CCTV making those withdrawals. The same day, Linda was going to her mother's house to try and convince her that they needed to move Farah's head from the park. As they passed the bridge over the canal at Ballybock, she saw the cordons and police activity. Had Farah been found? The next day, the 31st, Linda and her mother went to the crime scene. They stood at the cordon and craned their necks to see what the Gardaí were doing on the banks of the canal. They hoped that some gang member had been shot, but they knew in their bones that Farah had been found. Kathleen turned to another onlooker and asked what the story was. She was told that the police had found a man chopped up and thrown in the canal. The last flicker of hope that perhaps this wasn't Farah was gone. Kathleen went about informing people that Farah had left her, and she didn't know where he was. She told nearly everyone she met, her friends, Farah's friends and relatives, her landlord, and even the community welfare officer. She also set about replacing the large square of carpet that they had removed and thrown out. She blamed an infestation of cockroaches in the house for the missing piece, and complained to her landlord. He saw that there was a door-sized piece of carpet missing from the bedroom. She said that she was going to move out, but then changed her mind and just moved across the hall to share a flat with two other tenants. Meanwhile, Linda had remained mostly drunk since the murder. She was obsessed with Farah's head and was sure that they needed to move it. It had been spotted again by a local who visited the park every day to read and have a drink, and he had approached the park rangers and was convinced that it was the head of the man that had been found in the canal. But shortly after reporting his suspicions to the park rangers, the object was gone, leaving only a large hole where it had been. Linda had finally built up enough courage to go to the park, dig up Farah's head, which was in an awful state of decay, put it in a bag, and hide that in some bushes at another park. The next day, she moved the head again and took it to an area of scrubland about 40 minutes' walk from her home. She drank a bottle of vodka and fell asleep amongst the burnt-out cars in the field. When she woke, she began hitting the bag that contained the head with a hammer that she had brought with her. Eventually, she dug a hole and buried the shattered head in it and set fire to the bags that she had used to carry it to the field. She left behind the ashes, the hammer, and an empty bottle of vodka. A few days after the murder, Marie, another of Kathleen's daughters, returned home from work to find Charlotte crying inconsolably. Charlotte told her what had happened, that they had killed Farah, but Marie didn't believe her. Charlotte often told tall tales, and though she seemed genuinely upset, Marie put it down to Charlotte making up stories. She took pause when the news broke that a body had been found in the canal, but she didn't know what to do, so she put it out of her mind. At some point after the murder, Kathleen and Linda, and possibly Charlotte, confessed the murder to two of Kathleen's sons, John Jr. and James, who were both serving time in Wheatfield Prison for serious road traffic offences. One day while visiting them, Kathleen broke down and confessed the crime in detail. They didn't believe her, but eventually Linda confirmed the story to them. On the 16th of May, Ali Abu Bakar made contact with the Gardi. He reported to the Gardi that a friend of his, also from Somalia, was missing. His name was Farah Noor, and Ali had last seen him the weekend of St. Patrick's Day in the company of his girlfriend and two other women. Farah was drunk at the time, and he was wearing his Ireland jersey. Ali had tried to ring Farah a few times, but had never gotten through to him. And when he saw the description in one of the newspapers of the body that had been found in the canal, he decided to contact the police. The Gardi began making inquiries. First, they contacted the mother of Farah's child, but she had not seen him since 2002. They took swabs from the boy and sent them off for DNA testing to see if there was a match. They then turned to the woman that Farah had been last seen with, Kathleen Mulhall. She decided that she would talk to the Gardaí at the station and told him the story that Farah had left her and she hadn't seen him since February, although she hadn't informed her landlord that Farah had left until the 25th of March. They decided to search the flat that the two had shared. It was now lived in by two women, who agreed for the Gardaí to search and take samples. They swabbed various areas in the apartment, from the beds to the dressing table, and noted that it looked as if the carpet had been removed from the bedroom floor. The Gardaí also looked at Farah's bank account and found that it had last been used on the 30th of March and that there was very little money in it. They checked his phone records and discovered that the phone was not used from the end of March until June 2005. When they tracked down the person that was using the phone, they discovered that it had been purchased by him from John Mulhall, the ex-husband of Farah's girlfriend, Kathleen. Things were starting to come together, but the Gardaí still weren't sure who the body in the canal was or what precisely had become of Farah Swalinor. 
On the 11th of July 2005, Gardy received a phone call from John Mulhall Jr., who was calling on a smuggled mobile phone from inside Wheatfield Prison. He said that he knew the identity of the body in the canal to be Farah Swale Noor, and that he had been killed and dismembered by his sisters, Linda and Charlotte. The two men were taken from their cells by the Gardy and questioned about what they had been told by Kathleen, that she had gotten the girls drunk and spiked Farah's drink to bring about Farah's murder. According to them, she had planned the whole thing, and John Mulhall was in on it. The men were, quote, disgusted by their sisters' and mother's actions, and they wanted to be moved, together, out of Wheatfield, to a nicer prison, maybe the medium security Midlands or the open prison at Sheldon Abbey. On the 16th of July, while detectives were going back and forth with the Mulhall boys, DNA testing confirmed that the body in the canal was that of Farah Noor, and a more in-depth forensic examination of the flat in Richmond Cottages was arranged to take place at the end of the month. It was one of the first times that luminol, a chemical that reacts under blacklight when it comes in contact with blood, was used in the country. There was blood spatter found in the bedroom, on the walls and the floor, evidence of a very serious assault. The Gardaí had their crime scene. By this time, though, the Mulhall brothers had stopped cooperating with the Gardaí. They refused to make statements and never got their transfers out of Wheatfield. But it didn't matter. The Gardaí had enough evidence at this point to arrest the three Mulhall women and John Sr. On the 2nd of August, the Gardaí decided to bring the Mulhalls in simultaneously. They arrested the four of them and held them in two separate Garda stations, where the evidence that had been gathered against them was put to them each. The phone calls of John Jr. and James, the sighting on O'Connell Street, the blood evidence in the house, the mobile phone, the CCTV, and the money withdrawals. Linda was held at Store Street Garda Station for 12 hours. The evidence was put to her, but she denied everything. Charlotte was taken to Mount Joy Garda Station, and she too denied any knowledge of the killing of Farah Noor. She said she remembered nothing of the month of March, and that her brothers must be, quote, fucked in the head, end quote, for thinking that they were involved. The Gardaí tried to goad her into making admissions, but Charlotte wouldn't budge. No one at the time knew that Charlotte was by then two months pregnant. Kathleen was arrested and taken into custody while she was waiting at the post office to collect her social welfare payment. She said she was expecting the Gardaí and had been planning on going to Mountjoy Station herself. She spoke to her solicitor over the phone. She denied any knowledge of the killing of Farah Noor, just like her daughters. She said that she had been with Farah and her daughters on the 20th of March, but that she and Farah had parted ways, and she spent that night working the streets as a sex worker. She didn't know why her sons had said that she had had a hand in the death of Noor, and suggested that they might have been after a reward. She insisted that she didn't know that Farah was dead until she was told by the Gardaí upon her arrest that morning. She made no admissions, and like the two girls, was released after 12 hours of questioning. When John Sr. was collected and questioned about his involvement in the death of Farah, he denied having been in the area, or having helped to dispose of the carpet and clothing. He did, however, admit that he had sold a phone that one of the two girls had given him, but stated categorically that he did not know it had been Farah's. Again, he was released. The Gardaí did not have enough evidence to send files on to the DPP after questioning the four, but felt that they had gained important insights into the family. They thought that if they kept pressure on Linda and John Sr., that it might be possible to get them to crack and provide further information. The Gardaí were right in their suspicions that Linda was the weak link in the whole affair. She was put under pressure not only by the guards, but by her family as well. Her younger sister Maria berated her for involving their father in the whole mess, and eventually this pressure from two sides had an impact. Linda confessed everything to the Gardaí, and brought them to where she had buried Farah's head in the field. The site was forensically examined, but nothing was ever found. The Gardaí allowed Linda to stay at home while she was giving statements to the police and trying to convince her sister to come forward too, but eventually she was formally arrested and released on bail while awaiting trial. Meanwhile, Kathleen had left Dublin for Carlo and told no one she was going. The Gardaí finally tracked her down, and she was re-arrested on the 13th of September. She refused to tell the Gardaí what had happened the night Farah died. Meanwhile, Kathleen had left Dublin for Carlo, and told no one where she was going. The Gardaí finally tracked her down, and she was re-arrested on the 13th of September. She refused to tell the Gardaí what had happened the night Farah died, and said that she had been out looking for Johns in the Bagot Street area of the city that night. At one point, she denied ever having been in a relationship with Farah, despite saying that she had given him over €6,000 in the course of their relationship to send to his family back in Kenya. She said that when she arrived back at the flat, the drawers in her dressing table were pulled out, and Farah's things were gone. She never saw or heard from him again. She denied using his ATM card. She denied the abuse in their relationship, although she did admit that she was scared of him, that he carried knives, and that once he had attacked her and she had to fight him off. She admitted he had threatened to kill her and her family a number of times. She said that she didn't know why Linda was saying what she was, but she told the guardie that Linda was a very troubled person, and that she was unstable. Her word was not to be trusted. Charlotte was arrested on the 17th of October, 2005. She had been giving them the runaround, moving, not answering her phone, and finally her father managed to pin her down and get her to agree to be picked up. During questioning, she initially told the guardie that she and her sister had left the flat at Richmond Cottages at around 10pm the night Farah Noor was killed. She said that they had spent the night walking around the city centre, drinking and smoking heroin, and that they had arrived back at the flat to find that their mother had killed and dismembered Farah. This was all despite the fact that the guardie had Linda's confession, and Charlotte knew it. 
After some pressured questioning, however, Charlotte admitted that she and Linda had helped to dispose of the body in the canal, and eventually, after going around in circles for hours, Charlotte cracked and admitted her part in the murder. She said that her mother had repeatedly yelled at the girls to, quote, kill him for me, end quote, and that it had been Kathleen's idea, too, to cut up Farah and dump him in the canal. John had maintained contact with the Gardaí and did his best to encourage his daughters to do the right thing. He had been interviewed a number of times and admitted going to the Richmond Cottages flat the night of the murder and to dumping the things at his boss's house, though he insisted that the items had nothing to do with the murder. Mainly, he tried to keep his family together. Linda and her four kids were living with him after the murder, and as she began to drink more and more, he took up the care of his grandchildren. What little stability was left in the Mulhall household was shaken and perhaps destroyed early in December 2005. On the 8th of December, John, his youngest daughter Marie, and his brother Eric, whom he worked with, went out to a pub and spent the evening drinking and socialising with some old friends of John's. The three of them then headed back to the house in Tala. When they arrived, they found Linda worse for the wear. She had obviously been drinking quite heavily, and at one point, she flew into a rage, saying that Charlotte had stolen money from her, and began ranting at her father, that he was useless, and he had never done anything for them. Eventually, he managed to calm her down, and promised he would get the money back from Charlotte. He left the house, and began driving around, looking for Charlotte. He never found her, and he never returned home. John Mulhall was found in the Phoenix Park the next day by the jogger. He had hanged himself from a tree near to the Wellington Monument. Charlotte Mulhall had had her baby on the 28th of May 2006, just a few short months before her trial for murder was to begin. Initially, both Mulhall women absconded, and the proceedings had to be adjourned until they could both be located. The trial began on the 12th of October 2006. The girls pled not guilty to the charges, and the jury of six men and six women were sworn in for what would be a nine-day trial. They heard from the coroner's office that Farinor had suffered stab wounds all over his body, and had been dismembered after his death. His head and penis were also removed. They heard from his friend that he had seen Farinor the day he disappeared in the company of Kathleen and her daughters, wearing his Ireland away jersey. Forensic scientists from the Garda Technical Bureau described the findings from the flat at Richmond Cottages, and recounted how a number of bloodstains and blood spatter was found in the flat, consistent with a serious attack having taken place low down near the floor, and that there was evidence of a clean-up as blood was present in the crevices of the wardrobe, but not on the surface, indicating that it had been wiped away. The blood samples taken were a match for Farinor. Marie Mulhall, the youngest of the daughters, testified to the conversation that she had had with a drunken Charlotte, where Charlotte had explained that she was upset because she had killed Farah Swelly Noor with Linda, and that their mother had been present. The man who had spotted Farah's head in the park in Tala described how he had kicked at it, and dislodged it slightly, but stated that he decided it had nothing to do with him, and bearing in mind that he had a problem with alcohol, he wasn't sure that he had actually seen it, or that he would be believed if he had gone to the police. Linda and Charlotte did not testify, so the various statements that they had made to the Gardaí were read out and into the court by the interviewing Gardaí. As Charlotte's statements were read into the record, she lost her composure, and the judge was informed by her defence team that she felt she was going to be ill. The trial was adjourned for the day. The next day, the jury heard Linda's statement that her mother had encouraged the girls to kill and dismember Farah Swelly Noor, and testimony of Farah's violent behaviour from his previous girlfriends. Closing statements were delivered on the ninth day of the proceedings, and while the prosecution asserted that on the basis of the shocking and disturbing evidence that they had heard over the course of the trial, guilty verdicts were appropriate. Linda's counsel stressed that although both cases were being heard together, they must be considered on their own merits. Both defence teams had stressed the idea that the girls had acted in self-defence when they attacked Noor, in the hopes that the defence of provocation would reduce their sentences if found guilty. The judge gave direction relating to the legal formula required to prove murder and manslaughter, and the jury retired on the 25th of October, at half past twelve, to consider their verdict. Most of the press and the seasoned court reporters that were present when the jury retired were betting on a guilty verdict to be returned quickly, within a few hours. This wasn't the case, however, and the deliberations went on until the next day, when the judge decided that he would allow a majority verdict of ten to two if no consensus could be reached. When the jury filed back into the courtroom, they had questions about self-defence and provocation. They spent the next night in a hotel, and on Friday afternoon informed the judge that they were deadlocked. He offered any further clarification that required, and stated that if they were in any doubt about the evidence presented, that they should find in favour of the accused. There were a number of children depending on the outcome of this trial, but he also said that he wanted them to keep deliberating. That evening, at half six, they returned and declared another deadlock. They had reached a majority verdict, but not the one specified by the court. The prosecution were unhappy when the judge sent them back out, as he felt that Justice Carney's statements regarding the quality of the evidence could be leading the jury to find the accused woman not guilty. But Carney dismissed this complaint, telling the barrister to be real. The jury gave up after half an hour, and were sent home for the third time to spend the night in a hotel, and resume talks in the morning. At half two that afternoon, after 18 hours of deliberation, the jury returned with a verdict that satisfied the judge and the court. 
Charlotte was found guilty of the murder of Farris Wally Noor by a majority of 10 to 2, and Linda of his manslaughter by a majority of 11 to 1. Both women wept with relief and despair when they were remanded in custody to await sentencing on the 4th of December, 2006. The verdict came just in time to ensure that they would make the headlines of the Sunday morning editions of the newspapers the next day. The women were now known as the Scissor Sisters to the Irish public. They were sent to the women's wing of Mountjoy Prison, known as the Doka Centre, Dochus being the Irish for hope. It has a focus on rehabilitation and is known for being one of the gentler romance centres in the country. And as it was founded in 1999, it's in stark contrast to the horrible conditions of the Victorian Mountjoy men's prison right next door. Theoretically, each prisoner has her own room and can effectively come and go as she pleases throughout the day, within the limits of the institution. The Mulhall women were housed close together on the same wing of Hazel House in the Doka Centre and socialised with one another every day. Charlotte seems to have kept her head down, whereas Linda has been disciplined, once for threatening to kill another inmate. Court 2 of the Four Courts building was filled with press and public on the 4th of December, awaiting sentencing of the two sisters, and coincidentally the hearing of Padre Nelly, a farmer who was being retried for murder after he shot intruders on his isolated farm. But that is surely a story for another time. His hearing was first, where he yet again pled not guilty, and then Justice Carney turned to the other cases before him that morning. The Office of the Director for Public Prosecutions attempted to have the sentencing hearing of the sisters put off to another date, as Farinor's mother would not be present in court to give a victim's impact statement. But the judge was less than pleased at this and said that the state had had plenty of time to arrange for anyone who needed to be at the hearing to be present for that date. The Mulhalls were not called before the judge until half twelve that day, and when they arrived in court, some of Linda's legal team were absent, as they were also attending the Nally hearing, which had been moved to another courtroom. This is pretty common, but Justice Carney was furious at the delay. After 10 minutes of waiting for either the senior or a junior counsel to attend, Carney adjourned the case for 25 minutes. Finally, at 12.45, Judge Carney resumed the bench that this was one of the worst cases he had ever heard, and that it was one of only three cases in the country where such mutilation had occurred. The details of the crime were gone through again by guard testimony. Linda's team outlined how Linda had genuine remorse for the acts, and that she had suffered psychologically, harming herself, and ending up in the psychiatric ward after the conviction. He told the judge that Linda was a good mother to her four children. He pled for leniency, but Mr. Justice Carney disagreed with him, and she was sentenced to 18 years in prison, three suspended. She'd served 15. The jury's belief in the defense of provocation saved her three years from the 18 maximum allowable for the offense. Linda cried as she realized that she would spend the next 15 years in Mount Joy. Charlotte was sentenced to mandatory life imprisonment, which was no shock to her. She knew it was coming as it was an automatic sentence, so she managed to remain calm and expressionless throughout the hour-long hearing. Linda was distraught after the sentencing and was monitored by the prison authorities as they feared that she might attempt to harm herself. She spent nearly all her time in her room crying. Charlotte seemed to be unaffected by her 18-year sentence. She did, however, make an application to be allowed to care for her eight-month-old son in prison, which is allowed in certain circumstances and catered for within the Doka Centre. It mainly applies to infants under nine months old who are being breastfed. Her baby had been placed in foster care, and as Charlotte was not nursing, and there was no other medical reason that would necessitate it, the courts thought it best that the child be left in his foster home, where he was well cared for, rather than being sent to live within the confines of a high-security prison. It was agreed, though, that Charlotte would be allowed to care for her child for a few hours each day, and she was set up in the Doka Centre in one of the rooms that accommodated this, until the baby turned one. Both women faced disciplinary action for being in possession of alcohol at various points. It would be thrown over the walls of the prison in plastic bottles or passed to inmates by members of the public. The prison is just outside the city centre, and it's easily accessible to the public. Today there are nets covering the yards that the prisoners use in order to curb some of the contraband that makes its way into the prison. Kathleen Mulhall was not charged or tried with her daughters. She fled to the UK and began calling herself Cathy Ward, and eventually settled in a council house in Shepherd's Bush, West London. She was eventually tracked down by journalist and author Mick McCaffrey and a photographer in December 2007. When she clocked them, she ran back into the house and turned off all her lights. But the game was up, and two months later, two Gardaí, accompanied by British police officers, knocked on her door, and she was told that the DPP was going to lay charges against her. She returned to Dublin voluntarily the next day, avoiding being arrested on foot of a European arrest warrant at a later date. Kathleen was arrested as soon as she landed in Dublin Airport and was taken to Mountjoy Garda Station, where she was charged with aiding and abetting the concealment of a crime. The next day, she was remanded in custody and sent off to be with her daughters at the Doka Centre. Charlotte was pleased to see her mother, whereas Linda was less so. It took her time to warm back up to her, eventually forgiving Kathleen and even moving into the same room together. 
In March 2008, new charges were added for obstruction by helping her daughters to clean up the apartment after Noor's death and for giving false information to the Gardaí regarding Noor's whereabouts and withholding information. Later that month, Charlotte's hearing to grant an appeal against her murder conviction was held. It was argued by her lawyers that the judge had put pressure on the jury when he told him that they needed to continue deliberations despite saying that they were deadlocked. But the state argued that it still took another day for the jury to reach a conclusion, and, if anything, the judge's remarks were more likely to have pointed the jury in favour of acquittal. He had said that if they weren't convinced of the evidence, then they should find them not guilty, and that they needed to bear in mind the children that were awaiting the results of the trial. Leave to appeal was refused. Soon after, Linda lost an appeal against the severity of her sentence, despite favourable probation reports outlining her difficult childhood and her strong remorse for the crimes, which had led to psychiatric problems for Linda. Bear in mind that probation reports are actually very influential documents in Irish courts. The three-judge panel decided that the trial judge had ruled appropriately by giving a sentence of 18 years with three suspended to account for her remorse and cooperation, and that no further years could be suspended as Linda had failed to engage with rehabilitative programs and counselling as had been recommended by the probation reports before the sentencing. Later that year, in August 2008, Charlotte Mohall was back in the newspapers after an anonymous source sent a photograph of her to the Evening Herald newspaper. The picture showed Charlotte holding a knife to a male inmate's throat while he held a birthday cake. The two worked together in the Doka Centre kitchen, and it was the male inmate's birthday. The picture showed the two smiling and laughing and caused a public outrage and a subsequent internal investigation in the Irish prison services. Not only had a convicted murderer had access to a potentially fatal weapon, the same sort of weapon to commit her crime no less, but the picture had been taken on a mobile phone, banned from all prisons in the state, and which had recently been the subject of a highly publicised crackdown. Charlotte was transferred to Limerick Prison shortly after as punishment, but when there was no evidence forthcoming that she had personally been involved in the possession of a mobile phone, she was transferred back to the Doha Centre, as no charges could be brought. In February 2009, Kathleen Mulhall pled guilty to her involvement in the murder of Farah Swally Noor. She cried as the details of the murder were read into the record. She was coincidentally sentenced by Justice Carney, who had presided over her daughter's trial, and taking account of her voluntary return to Ireland, her difficult childhood, and the abuse she had suffered at the hands of various partners, including Nora, she was sentenced to serve five years in prison, to be backdated to when she was first taken into custody, in February 2008. She was released after serving her time on the 25th of October, 2011. Kathleen returned to the UK, where she lived with her son James for some time. This arrangement fell apart when there was an argument with his partner, as to whether Kathleen could stay with them in their home in Leeds, which resulted in James stabbing his partner, 12 times. He was given a lengthy jail sentence for this crime. Linda Mulhall was reported to be hoping to spend her first Christmas as a free woman this year, but she missed out on this narrowly, having been released just last Wednesday, the 3rd of January. Most recent reports regarding Charlotte state that she is hoping to be released sometime this month also, January 2018. By most accounts, Farinor was not a pleasant man. He was accused of rape and domestic violence, and most certainly had a problem with drink. But his wife in Kenya remembers him fondly, however, saying that, despite him abandoning her and her children, she loved him, and he supported her by sending money when he could while he was away. Whichever portrait of Farinor you choose to paint, he certainly didn't deserve the violent and gruesome death and disposal that were meted out to him by the Irish Scissor Sisters. Thank you for listening to the Mens Rea podcast. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe, rate and review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter at Mens Rea Pod. Join in on the discussion at the Mens Rea Pod discussion group, or you can send us in your questions, comments, or suggestions at mensreapod at gmail.com. We've made some changes, so let us know what you think. Get in touch. I'd like to take a moment to thank our supporters on Patreon. You know who you are, and your support means a lot and helps to defray some of the production costs of the podcast. If you'd like to sponsor the podcast, head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash mensreapod. I'd also like to thank our five-star reviewers on Apple Podcasts. First off, to All Geeks Aside podcast. It's really nice to be shouting out another Irish podcast. Thanks so much for your review, guys. Happy New Year to MFN0082. Thank you very much. It's nice to hear that I have a nice accent. That's excellent. Now to Miss Mrs. Gummy Bear, who I'm presuming is from the northeastern part of the United States because she says we're wicked good. So that sounds like a Bostonian person to me. Then to Charlie in Kentucky, who's very kind, another lawyer type. So to Charlie in Kentucky, thank you very much for that. And one last one for today to these Boots. these Boots. Nice. I get it. Thank you very much for your lovely review. I hope you're still listening. I hope you enjoy this new episode. So thanks again to our five-star reviewers on Apple Podcast. As you all know, this podcast is researched, written, and produced by me, your host, Sinead. 
All sources for used for today's episode can be found on our website, www.mensreapod.com, and do check them out. There are some fantastic sources. Our brand new theme song is Quinn's Dance from Kevin MacLeod. I hope you like it. Let me know. And as always, till next time, don't do anything I wouldn't do.